Hi, everybody. It's been a long time for you as well as for me. That's actually my second J Prime, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, if you are stuck behind, there are still a couple of seats in front, like every time, because people like to stay in the back, but you can join or you can listen to the talk while standing, but it's a long time. I'm Nicola Frankel. I've been a developer for some time. You can see I have gray hair. I have more hair on the picture than right now, but yeah, that happens. Um, and uh, since a couple of years, I'm a developer advocate, but nobody cares about that anyway, so let's jump into the talk. Who here has ever designed a REST or a RESTful or an HTTP API? Quite a few people, that's great. Um, in general, my experience is that the first or the second time you do that, you are actually very focused on the REST semantics, on how to do everything by the book, on the model of your entities. And you might tend to forget some stuff that comes afterwards, such as like, how do you cope if you need to create a V2? So when the business comes to you and say, hey, we need a V2, this might be your reaction. Rings a few bells. So in general, this is your initial situation. You've got a couple, you've got what I will call an upstream or a backend service, but I will be using some dedicated semantics. So this is an upstream and you've got a couple of endpoints, then your clients can call the endpoints. Do you agree with this? That, that was a trap question, of course. In general, that's not the case. In general, you have an API getaway. Who knows what is an API getaway? Yeah, just raise your hand and keep them high, otherwise, great. That's still less than 50%. So most of you probably will tell me, hey, but we have something in between. We have something called a reverse proxy. And your API gateway stuff, that's not something we can cope with. That's actually true. But if you are doing APIs, you probably need API gateway. And the reason for that, I will take some time to explain because well, there is a short version of the talk and a long version of the talk, but since not like the majority of you know about API, I guess the way I prefer like to discuss it at some point. So first, as I mentioned, I'm, let's say, the, the positive side, I'm experienced, the bad side, I'm old. Um, so I started using the internet more than 20 years ago. And at the time, it was like, yeah, just the web is not the internet. This is a semantics. I'm very like precise on semantics. Like the internet is a lot more than the web. The web is just a way to link documents together. It was not a way to do applications. We are just using that channel because it exists, but it's actually, it was not great for a long, long time. Anyway, when I started doing my first site, it was HTML. We already had images. I was super proud to put some MIDI files, like audio files. Yeah, it was really, really bad, but at the time we didn't know better. It was like really cool. And guess what? No CSS, and even better, no JavaScript, folks. <laughs> no JavaScript. That was really the life at the time. And I used, <laughs> I found um, a screenshot of this like, amazing piece of software called Hot Dog Pro. Who here knows about Hot Dog Pro? One person. <laughs> Two, three. So I see one person here who is young, another one who has gray hair, and another one who doesn't have a lot of hair. So basically, yeah, probably old, old people like me. 
and this amazing piece of software to create your HTML, basically, it lets you choose the tag. So it was not with the at all. It just had a list of HTML tags, and you say, I want to use this tag. And of course, you had not to forget to use the closing tag. Like, amazing piece of software. Anyway, at the time, I didn't care that much how things worked, but basically, I was happy to put my files in a folder. And then it was served magically by your web server. And that was the ID behind the web server at that time. It was to serve static content. HTML, audio, later, JavaScript, images, whatever. Everything was static. But the web grew and grew. And basically, people starting to say, hey, I want to do more. And so some people designed Perl scripts to actually generate the HTML, CGI scripts. Who did Perl scripts to create? Yeah. Wow, more than Hot Dog Pro people. Actually, I never did. Uh, yeah, that was, at the time, I was really, really young. I, 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 did, I was not a programmer. But then having a script to generate your HTML was not really great. So somebody had an idea that, hey, perhaps we could write some HTML and insert tags, and then they would be magically rendered. And that was the beginning of PHP. And at the time, PHP meant personal home page. I kid you not. Of course, now that it's much, much pop popular, they rebranded the name Hypertext Preprocessor. It looks and sounds so much better, but it's personal home page. And well, with this dynamic stuff, we started to have more use case. So people started to say, mm, perhaps we can use like for some official communication channel. And when you start using a medium as a communication channel, you need it to be reliable. You need it to be stable. You don't want no downtime. And so the web server, like we had to add new capabilities, such as redundancy and load balancing. So now we add two layers of web server. The first one, what to do load balancing, and the second one, what to actually serve the content, which again was not only static content anymore, but dynamic. And it grew and grew and grew and grew, and well, up to the point we are today. And now, not every node was the same, because we wanted to have a lot of different websites and perhaps even applications, so that the first layer, the, 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 the entry point, now had to route according to some path or variables or whatever. And that's one more capability we had to stuff into the web server. So the web server evolved over time, from static to dynamic, to do some load balancing, to do routing. And now we have this entry point that we call a reverse proxy that can do a lot and a lot of stuff. And because, well, it's the entry point, we tend to add even more like capabilities, such as perhaps authorization, authentication, rate limiting, IP blacklisting, whatever. I mean, once you have your single point of entry, you can have a lot of capabilities. But the problem is, at this point, we are limited when we want to handle APIs. The thing is, why do we need APIs in the first place? Like, again, when I was young, a long time ago, we share data by putting a file in a FTP folder. Then there was a batch job that handled the content of the folder and renamed it, adding, let's say, the DON extension. That was the beginning of integration. Do you believe it? Have, has any of you done that already, this FTP integration stuff? Yeah. Hey, you are young. 
No, you are not young. You look young. That's even better. Um, the thing is, it was great, but it was actually like not good if you wanted like real-time integration of data. And if you are in the same stack, of course, you can use whatever API your, provider, your, your stack provides, if you are in .NET, in Java, in whatever. But if you want to like, share data between like, heterogeneous, integration, in integra heterogeneous systems, then you need like, the most common brick. And the most common brick is HTTP. And that's the reason why we have like, REST-based APIs. And so the idea behind an API gateway is, is a reverse proxy, but it adds even more capabilities. For example, if you don't care, if you are not using APIs, probably you don't bill. Now, when you start having an API, probably you start thinking about billing usage from your customer. And in that case, you need like one additional feature. And of course, it would be completely possible to add this feature in a dedicated reverse proxy. For example, you could have an Nginx module for that. The problem in that case is Nginx was not designed for flexibility. Nginx was designed to be secure, to be fast, to be a lot of things. But if your billing business rule changes, you don't want to bring down your Nginx to recompile everything and to redeploy it again. You want the billing rule to be changed on the spot. And for that, you need a dedicated API gateway. And you can have like rate limiting based on some profile and so on and so forth. And so the idea of an API gateway is to bring all those features. There are a couple of API gateway on, already on the market. Um, you might have guessed that I worked for the Apache API 6 project, um, but there are others. I don't name the cloud-based one, because if you start using a cloud-based one, probably you will be inside a world garden. I'm talking about like API gateway that you can use wherever you go. So just a couple of words on Apache API 6. It's not an old project. Um, it was donated by a private company in 2019, and now it's part of the Apache like foundation, meaning it's the top-level project. So if you are interested, you can come, you can commit, you can do whatever you want. It's open source. So it's not only Apache license, it's handled by the Apache Foundation. The architecture is pretty simple, actually. It's an Nginx. Yeah, it works. It's an Nginx at the foundation. Then you've got an open Resty, which is a Lua engine. And then you've got a lot of plugins available out of the box, meaning that if you want to extend um, hello, Apache API 6, uh, you uh, write Lua plugins. Anyway, now this is my first step. I want to introduce the API gateway. Throughout this presentation, because I think that slideware is super boring, and I have, I have run out of jokes about my age, I will do a demo just to keep you entertained. So here, I've created a project. And this is not this one. This is this one. And this project is actually, I have two API. I have the old API. And I will show you some Java codes. So this is a very, very interesting API. I can return hello world, or I can return hello whatever. And this is a Spring Boot application, like very simple. And I mean, you don't see anything? No, I, you have a question. Uh, the thing is, I cannot hear you, so you need to shout. Can I remove what? Uh, can you remove the uh, eye shield? Can I remove what? OK, the red light. On the the red light? Yeah. Which red light? Sorry. <laughs> Can anybody help the gentleman tell me what he wants? Because I cannot understand what red light. OK, 
my screen is, yeah, come, come, no worries. The eye protection, I have, don't have any eye protection. Okay. Come to my screen. No, come, don't I, I, please. Ah, brightness. This? Like this? Ah, is it better? I mean, but that's good. That's interactive. I love it. So if you have any question because you don't see my screen, that's fine. Or anything related or unrelated. Um, so this is a Java application with Spring Boot with annotation. And everybody nowadays tell you this is really, really bad. So instead, we have a new version, which is in Kotlin, with one single annotation only. Obviously, this is much better. Who agrees this is much better? Yeah, but not that many people. Well, too bad. So for the con <laughs> in the context of this talk, I will say this is better. Um, now I have prepared my architecture, so I will use Apache API 6 because this is the API gateway that I know about the most. And uh, API 6 relies on etcd, which is a key value distributed storage that is used as part of Kubernetes. So this is where Kubernetes stores its configuration. Then I will, if I have time, I will show the dashboards. Then I have monitoring, so I have Prometheus and Grafana. And I have deployed my old API, but because I'm super lazy, I don't want to do it in two steps, so I will deploy the new API in one go. So I will do everything in one go. I will start that. So Docker Compose start up. And I hope that I'm in the right folder. Yes. So it takes not that long to start everything, because all the images are, have already been built. And now we can try to call the old and the new API. So curl local hosts 8081, and let's say hello. Wow. And let's say uh, Ivan. And because we are inclusive, Ivana. Perfect. So now, this is the old API. And first step, I want to put this like API gateway in front. So I, I'm using the other port. So the port of the API gateway. And unfortunately, it doesn't work. Is it big enough? Yes, OK, because I, as I'm, I, I told every time, I'm quite old, and so probably I wouldn't see, but you are young, so it's fine. Um, so it doesn't work. And the reason for that is I just like started the API gateway, so now what I need to do is I need to configure it. So let's configure it. And because I'm super lazy, I've already written everything. So API, Apache API 6 allows you to like be very flexible in your configuration, meaning that it has a REST API to handle the routes. So here what I'm doing, I, I'm using Docker since I've like started everything on Docker Compose. I run on a specific network. And why I'm using Docker? Because I don't want you to use curl yourself. So everything is on GitHub. So you don't need to install everything but Docker if you want to start again. Um, here is the route. I will create the route with ID1. Because it's a very sensitive and critical operation, you need to be authenticated. Here, it's stupid. I've reused the default key, but there is one. And then you need to pass whatever you want. So here, the name, if you want, the methods, the URIs. And here, I will describe what I call an upstream. And normally, an upstream is generally a cluster of nodes that have the same function. Here, I have one single node, because again, this is a demo. So normally, I need to like the, the, the algorithm is important. Here, I put anything run Robin, because I have one single node. And I set a plugin, which is Prometheus, because I want everything to be monitored. So let's run this. And now, if I curl again, it works. That's basically 
the initial situation plus an API gateway, and basically we are back on the initial situation, just that we have another port. But it allows a lot of options as of now. So we want to, involve, uh, to evolve our API, and the biggest problem is, well, if we want to evolve our API, we need to somehow like set a version. There are multiple ways to set versions. You can set a version in a header. You can set a version in a query parameter. You set the version in the path. Everything can be supported by most API getaways, but here I think the path is the most visible one. So I want to create a new route that allows for this V1 stuff. I will go here, and on this first step, what I did is I created everything in one go. But probably, if you want to be serious about it, you see that this step, this upstream, can be reused probably by a lot of different configuration, by a lot of different routes. So Apache API 6 allows you to model them. So we will first create the upstream correctly, so there is a new uh, endpoint called upstreams. Good. And we can create the upstream. Now we can create the plugin configuration. Again, there is a new route for that. And we create it. And finally, we create the version route. So I will update the plugin configuration because I need to rewrite the URL. The reason for that is now my client we call slash v1 slash hello slash whatever. And if I just forward v1 something to my upstream, the upstream doesn't know about v1. So I need to remove the v1 prefix. So this is the ID. I will rewrite the URI and remove the prefix. And then I can create the new route. So I will give it a new ID with the upstream ID and the plugin config ID that I've created previously. And now, if I do the same, it works. Now, if we go on the dashboard, and I need to remember which port, because I always forget the port. Dashboard is 9,000. So local host 9,000. We go on the dashboard, and it asks for a login password, which is admin admin, because again, demo. And now we can see the two routes that we created. I hope it's big enough, but I'm afraid that if I make it a bit bigger, it might break the configuration, so yes. I hope you have good eyes. And so here you can check the details, or if you're interested, you can uh, directly see the JSON and change the JSON directly there. So depending if you are more like common line oriented or if you are more like GUI oriented, you can do whatever you want. And we can see the upstream now that we have created with a type round robin. Good. So it works, and the model tells us that it works correctly. The next step is we want people to start using the V1. Because imagine that at this point, we have a V1, so a versioned endpoint and an unversioned endpoint. And if both are available, people might, start con to meet, might continue to use the unversioned one. We want to cut that. We want now new users to start using the V1. So the idea is that we should probably use the HTTP 301 to tell people, hey, like it has moved. You, you, you cannot use it anymore. So again, this is configuration. Oops, sorry. And this is a new plugin called Redirect. And so on the route, the first one, the first one that I created, I will tell people, sorry, false, 
use the one with v1 and 301. So if I run this config, and now I run the inversion route, it tells me, uh, sorry, 301. And if we, here there are two use cases. So basically either like clients are automatically following and then it works, or they are at least monitoring. Well, I hope for you, if you are using an API, you are monitoring your calls, then you can check that you will have 301s, and then in the header, you will have this like, new location to follow v1 slash hello. So that's the problem at the moment, is we need to rely on the HTTP semantics because we don't know our users. Because in general, when you start providing an API, you don't want people to register like immediately. You want to attract, like, let's say, a critical mass. And probably people don't want to register. Who here wants, likes to register when they, they use a service? Yeah, nobody wants to register. But you as a provider, you want people to register. But there are already people using the service without having been registered. So what you want is to provide an incentive, saying, hey, if you register, like when you go at the booth here, you just want the swag, right? But the sponsor, they ask you to give your contact details. So the swag is the incentive. And here we will do the same trick. We will provide an incentive saying, for example, hey, if you want to enjoy unlimited API calls, you need to register. If you don't register, you can still use our API, but we will rate limit you. And for that, there is no plugin. There is no plugin. So what I had to do, and it's not fun, so first I will limit the stuff. I had to create another plugin. So there is a rate limit plugin, but it's actually like hard-coded, rate limit. So I had to do is I had to copy the rate limit plugin and to create my own unauth limit plugin. And I had to write Lua. Who here is a Lua developer? Nobody? So I can show the code because then I won't be shamed. OK, so like, eh. here you provide the schema, and basically the schema tells how, what, what attributes are optional, what attributes are required in the plugin config. Then you need to set a couple of required attributes for the plugin itself, so version priority. Priority is very, very important. You will notice that here the priority is hard-coded and it's how it is at the moment. I'm fighting to change it, and I will, in uh, the next uh, slide, or two next slides, I will show you why it's a very bad idea to have a hard-coded priority. Then you reference the, ch the schema that I created, and basically my code gets here. So this is what I added. I'm super proud of it because I'm not a Lua developer. So basically, I will check if there is somebody who has authenticated with the KeyAuth plugin already. Uh, so I, 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 I check if there is a configuration for that. I will check in the cache if there is somebody who is authenticated with this key. And if I found there, it's OK. If I didn't find them, I continue, and probably I will like limit them with whatever I've configured. So here, what I did is I say, hey, if you call me more than twice in a 60-second time window, I will rate limit you, send you this code, and give you, more importantly, this message, the how to register. So if I run this, and I do the calls, sorry. I will remove the V. Yes. So now I'm rate limited. And I know that in order to enjoy unlimited calls, I need to register. Great. So how do we register? 
As I mentioned here, I want to keep things super simple. So what I did is I created one single person to register. Sorry, not this, this one. And here it says that basically if you use the key my key, you will be authenticated as John do. So we can like run the script. We can check that the consumer has been created. Perfect. And now, if I pass, oops, not this one, here. If I pass it here, so dash H, and I think the default is API key, but you can, of course, like override it, my key. So now I'm John Zhu, and because I'm John Zhu, I'm authenticated, and because the plugin logic means if you are authenticated, just let it pass. I pass. That's not bad. Now we want to start thinking about v2 finally. So we have developed v2, and we actually want to check that v2 works correctly. So who here does unit testing to make sure that everything works? OK. Integration testing? OK. YOLO? <laughs> of course. Um, actually, even if you do unit testing and integration testing, there is still a chance that it doesn't work that well and you don't want to break your customers. So the idea in general is to do canary, canary release. You test in production. Uh, and in order to test in production, but not to break everybody, you release to just a fraction of your clients. But you can do a bit better before. What you can do is to mirror the traffic. So, because probably in your integration test or in unit test, you did ac account for every possible use case that happens in production. Only the true production workload can test everything. So you want to direct Every, every request to your V2, check that it works and completely disregard the results. But at least you will be able to check that, for example, with the same workload, you've got the same HTTP status. If, for whatever reason, with the same workload, V1 gives, let's say, 10, 500, and V2 10, gives out 100 or 1,000 of 500s, probably you have an issue. So, this is how you do it. You've got this plugin called like Proxy Mirror. So, let's run it. And in the meanwhile, I will check the dashboard. So, local hosts. And I think the Prometheus one is. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. OK, so here I'm on my Grafana. Here you have got the default dashboard for Apache API 6. And what I did with a couple of configuration twitch, then I was able to add those like two widgets, one for the old API, one for the new API. And again, what I want is to have the exact same curves, saying, hey, now that I'm mirroring the traffic, I should get the same result. So let's do some like crazy stuff. And after some points, we should get the data. So now we have the data. And again, it should be the same curves. But it's not. The people who, are, who have good eyes or are sitting in the front or who have both will notice that here I have a 4 or 4. And the reason for that is that my configuration sucks. The reason for the configuration to suck is that actually here I tried to be smarter, but it didn't work. Remember, I told you at the beginning that I, was, I, I removed the v1 prefix to forward it so that the upstream doesn't know about the v1 prefix. The thing is, this proxy rewrite stuff happens later. So basically, first it duplicates the load, and it's already sent, and basically, the V1 only happened afterwards on the main V1 route. So here I try to be smarter using another plugin, which happens 
before, but it doesn't work either. And so this is a bug, and we are trying to fix it. So I'm very straightforward with you. At the moment, it doesn't work, but it should be the way to do it. So now that we have managed to make sure that, imagine that it worked, and we have managed to make sure that actually the V2 route doesn't create more issues than the V1, we can actually start doing the canary release. And there are a lot of ways to do canary. Again, you can be based upon a header, you can be based upon a query parameter, you can just be based on geolocation or whatever. Here, for the purpose of this demo, what I do is I have a simple rule, like I will send half the loads to the V1 and half the, ro the loads to the V2. So if we start doing that, Ah, I didn't run it, of course. If I don't run it, then it doesn't work that well. And now, wow, hey, it's much better. The V2 is much better, right? Yes, so half the load should be on one node, one of the load should be on the other node, on the upstream, sorry. Well, at this point, it's pretty good. The only thing that I need to know is to create the V2 route. So I create the V2 route, and I can actually call the V2. Perfect. Now we have an issue. We have two versions of the same application, and probably you know that it's not a good idea to keep too many. So here is the canary release. We want to deprecate our endpoint, our v, v1. At some point, we want to deprecate it. So HTTP, HTTP doesn't have anything related to that, but there is an IETF draft that says how you can deprecate your endpoints. And this is through a header. And the, the, the header is called deprecation. You can probably set a date. So it's good if, you are, if it's a future date. Or you can just set a boolean if you're super lazy, because it's a demo, I will be super lazy. Then you have a link that points to the new resource to use, because when you deprecate something, please, please tell people what to use instead. Don't just say, hey, it's deprecated, and you're on your own. And also, you've got an additional header. So deprecation says, hey, you shouldn't use it anymore. And such set means, hey, it will be removed completely. So let's do that. It's very easy. In that case, it's just two stupid headers to add. So I will be deprecating the v1 routes. And for that, I'm using these response rewrites on the header this time. And I just add deprecation header true. So this is a fixed value. And here in the link, I'm reusing some of the variables. So it's pretty easy. And if I use v1 and it's not necessary. I need to, do, to be verbose about it. Otherwise, you don't see anything. Here, deprecation true. And you should use this link. So that's how you do it. And now, at this point, step nine, enjoy. Enjoy life. Next time your business comes, hey, you must like do a V3. If you implement it, like all the steps that I've shown you, it should be like a walk in the park, or so I believe. So thanks for your attention. You can read my blog. You can follow me on Twitter. If you're interested about the codes, as I mentioned, everything is on GitHub. So please check it. If you have like issues, right issues, if you want to improve it, please improve it. And um, well, if I got you interested in Apache API 6, have a look. And now there is time for question, and we have six minutes. Yes, can one of the... Oh, wow, amazing, you are fast. Thanks a lot. Experience with uh, another API gateways, so you can compare. So no, I don't have any experience with other API gateways, and so I cannot compare. OK, thanks. I told you I was a consultant a long time ago, and, and yeah, I, either I was a good consultant or a bad consultant, because if I didn't know, I didn't try to bullshit anybody. I just say, no, I don't know. Hi. Hi. 
Great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, does it support OpenAPI for any of the configurations? Yes, you, ca you can authentic. I've shown you the most basic authentication plugin, which is basically pass an API key, but we support OpenAPI, we support Keycloak, and a few others that I don't remember. Thanks. No other questions? Perfect. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of the conference.